What is strategy? I mean, what do we mean when we talk about strategy? You know, this is a concept that we're supposed to be talking about, and I'm not clear that we've actually interrogated it sufficiently. Okay? So before we get into the question of what socialist strategy can be in the era of extended austerity, uh, I want to ask a question, um, and not necessarily to answer it completely, I just want to ask you the question of what do we mean when we talk about strategy? How does strategy differ from tactics? How does having a strategy differ from not having a strategy? It seems to me that a minimal condition for having a strategy is knowing what the other side is doing, or having some sense of what the other side is going to do. Having some sense of the terrain that one is fighting on. Having some sense of the rules of the game. Having a realistic analysis. So I want to contextualize this question historically. Rather than try to talk about uh, strategy in some abstract sense, I want to uh, place it in some sort of context. And the context that uh, I recognize, and maybe will have some relevance for you, um, is one in which the traditional ways of organizing on the socialist left have gone into crisis. Okay? We had the worst capitalist crisis in generations since the Depression. And where I come from, we were always told when capitalism enters a crisis, then we'll see. Then we will see the vapors of neoliberal ideology will lift, the workers will recognize their true interest, and they will begin the fight back. <laughs> that didn't happen exactly. Um, we were told briefly that neoliberalism was dead. It wasn't. Um, if anything, neoliberalism <coughs> has been doubled down on. Um, and so. The moment of rupture that was supposed to rescue us um, did nothing of the kind. If anything, it turned out that the crisis of capitalism was also, and perhaps even more fundamentally, a crisis of the left. And I'm a Marxist and a historical materialist, and I, I have to admit, I probably should have known that. I should have seen that coming. And we all should have seen that coming. So. Why was the crisis of the left so terrible? Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about neoliberal capitalism and austerity capitalism and advance a few theses about it, um, because this is the strategic terrain that we're operating on, and try and relate that to leftist practice, to socialist practice. Um, but I want to advance before I come to that uh, three or four um, basic points about leftist um, practice um, in general. First thing is the working class, which is the traditional subject of socialist practice, it hasn't disappeared, but it has changed quite fundamentally. And I know that you're, many of you will be familiar with the, you know, the ways in which this has changed, and I don't want to sort of rehash stuff that you already know. You know about the declining rates of trade union participation. You know about the declining rates of working class participation in politics. You know about the decline of social democratic parties across Europe. Okay? I mean, if you don't know this, then it's not too difficult to find out. These are simple facts of the matter, okay? The working class is less and less represented in European political systems. It's less and less participating in European politics. And it's less and less organized as a working class movement and as a political subject. And this is a matter of design. It's an achievement of decades of class struggle by the rich, by the ruling class, and particularly by the financial section of the ruling class, um, and by their practice of uh, what is called neoliberalism. But there's other ways in which uh, the working class has changed. One of them is the fact that the working class has become feminized. There's a massive increase in the participation of women in workforces all across the world. 
And one result of this has been to increase the salience of questions of social reproduction. What that means is that if you've got a workforce where it depends upon the participation of women, but on a part-time and casualized basis, where they are still going home and still looking after the child, or still doing most of the housework, where you've got this articulation of capitalism and patriarchy, where women are doing the vast majority of the work in society, then that pushes the issue of feminist struggle right up the agenda. It becomes a class issue. I mean, it always was a class issue, but it's become more so. And in fact, if you think about it, the modality in which people live their class situation, it can't be reduced to the labor capital relationship. It can't be reduced to, uh, I go and I sell my eight hours a day to a boss uh, in a contract, I get a wage and I come home and that's it. That's not it. There's a lot more to it than that. Your class situation includes your interactions with the police, your interactions with the education system, your interactions with the job center or the unemployment agency or the welfare office. And all of these things are experienced differently if you're a woman, if you're racially oppressed, if you're gay, if you're a migrant worker. So the modality of your class experience uh, intersects with and is codependent upon a whole series of uh, axes and uh, forms of oppression and discrimination. But also, there is something about neoliberalism that uh, tends to, um, I don't know if it's neoliberalism specifically, but there's something certainly about capitalism wherein there is a tendency for more and more areas of life to become politicized. You can observe this with the body. The body is uh, more and more politicized. Um, the environment is politicized. You know. Um, and the multiplication of ways in which one can be politicized and can become radicalized means that uh, any attempt to embark upon a socialist politics has to be conscious of the ways in which, uh, even if you assume as I do, that class is the, uh, I think, the, the major antagonist in the structures in a society that is overdetermined by everything else that's going on, by all the other issues. Um, I mean, if you want to talk about the environment, for example, it doesn't make sense to talk about it unless you talk about environmental racism or the ways in which uh, dumping uh, waste, the ways in which uh, the degeneration of communities, the ways in which ecological catastrophe are structured in ways that punish the poorest members of society while the richest and most gated communities are protected and preserved. There's an example of this, actually. I don't know if any of you have read Michael Davis's book, um, uh, Ecology of Fear. There's a chapter in it called The Case for Letting Malibu Burn, um, which is uh, essentially about the fact that in the region of Malibu, uh, which is a luxury area uh, for the rich in the United States, the place is a natural locus for wildfires. There are always going to be wildfires there, but the rich have chosen to situate themselves there. And the result of that is that there has to be a huge amount of expenditure of public money and public labor fighting these fires so that rich people can continue to live there. Okay? So you can see how the management of the lived environment and the living environment <coughs> is shaped by class issues. Second thing that I want to mention in that connection is the changing way in which working class politics is formed. I mentioned already the stuff about declining social democracy, declining trade unions, and so on. Um, 
And this presents us with an opportunity. And that's going to be uh, an opportunity that we face across Europe. Um, but it's also a problem in many ways. And the opportunity is this. Where social democracy collapses, it leaves a vacuum. And in that vacuum, small groups with relatively little social weight can suddenly project tremendous influence out of nowhere. This is what has happened with Podemos. It's what's happened with Syriza. To some extent, it happened with the NPA, the Nouveau Anti-Capitalist Party in France. And the, um, you know, to an extent, probably it will happen uh, with um, the Green Party in, in England, although the Green Party does, in fact, increasingly have some sort of mass base. So, my point would be, I mean, and this doesn't just apply to party organization, by the way, and it's not just an electoral point, it's also a point to do with the movements. I don't know if you've had similar experiences, but when we had the student movement in the UK, briefly, uh, for a few months anyway, uh, the organizations that actually made stuff happen were tiny, totally unrepresentative group of schools that came out of the traditional far left. And they went on Facebook and they set a date. And people came because there was nobody else doing any organizing. There just wasn't an infrastructure there. And increasingly that is happening. As the old social democratic forms break down, as the left wing within them breaks down, there's going to be a space for small groups to exert influence. And sometimes they can exert it in irresponsible and destructive ways, but if you play it cleverly and intelligently and with a good strategic sense, you can use that to your advantage. Syriza, when it went into uh, the electoral challenge in 2012, <laughs> It didn't really have very much. I mean, it had a tradition of existence. It had uh, some roots in the social movements. It didn't have much of a base in the trade union movement. All it really had was a good slogan for a government of the left against austerity. And because of that, they nearly took over the, uh, the left wing of the electoral system. And then eventually did so. So this is something I'm arguing is not... Um, an accident, I'm saying it's conjunctural, it's part of the situation that we're in, and if we're thinking about if we're thinking strategically, we should be thinking about how to utilize that. We should also think about um, the format of social movements. One of the things about social movements is that, I mean, th this is, it's a default today that, you know, if you want to attack uh, or address any particular issue, you have a social movement. You get uh, a variety of groups involved, church groups, civil society groups, political parties, individuals of no particular affiliation, and you bring them all together into a mass, a big display of unity and worthiness and numbers. Now the problem with this is, I mean, it, it's all very good, don't get me wrong, but there's a problem with this. It can lead to the NGOization of politics. And what I mean by that is that you could end up with a situation like, uh, you know, where essentially um, NGOs like LiveIt can come along, uh, declare a movement to exist. Uh, they've got money, they've got resources, uh, they declare a big central event. Uh, there was another event recently, a bit like Live Aid actually, which did the same thing, uh, in, in Hyde Park in London. Everybody turns up, well not everybody, but a few tens of thousands of people turn up, uh, hoping to make a difference. They get there, they have their big day, there's an ecstatic moment of unity, some rock stars play music, uh, some comedians tell jokes, and you know, everybody's having their big day, and then they all go home and nothing's changed, and there's no movement left, and there's no infrastructure, and there's nothing. And you're left wondering what the hell that was about. Maybe it was an entertaining day out. And increasingly, this happens within real political movements. I mean, you know, no matter how serious they are, there are these tendencies, you know, you uh, get stuck in this repetitive mode of marching from A to B, and then having a bit of a spectacle, and everybody going home. The problem with social movements is that in and of themselves, a social movement is not an infrastructure. It leaves no institutional trace, it cannot embody its successes and perpetuate them, carry them on, and all too often what it leaves is the psychic injuries of defeat. So we need to think about how to interact with social movements and to produce something out of that, some mode of organization, 
wherein those successes can be perpetuated. And I think uh, a political party is the obvious uh, answer to that. Quite what the format of the political party should be will depend upon the concrete situation, but uh, something wherein the interests of that movement can be uh, concentrated, where the experience can be concentrated, and where the arguments that are heard within that movement can be articulated, and not just articulated in their bare form, but worked out and reasoned through and thought through and to develop into a series of intelligent slogans and political arguments. Okay? So, there's another aspect of the social movement phenomenon. I mean, we're often told uh, by sociologists who work in this field that we are living in a social movement society. Practically every issue convokes a social movement of some kind. Well, one thing that we should be aware of, aware of is the geographical and spatial issue here. I mean, this may seem uh, like it's uh, not such a big deal, but actually uh, most historical social movements that were successful were movements, you know, national social movements, were movements of the big cities, right? They were movements, particularly of the left, rooted in the big cities. So you should, if you're really thinking about developing a social movement and developing a political organization articulated with that, be thinking about how to channel your resources through several large urban areas as the core uh, and most likely the most politicized and militant core of that movement. The alternative to um, developing uh, some sort of political organization, political expression of these movements, is that is that we let we leave it to collapse we let the momentum go we let the energy go and it dissipates and the initiative falls to the right and i think we've all uh, seen examples in northern europe where the far right um, uh, the populist right from UKIP to the uh, Alliance for Deutschland uh, to the Front National, who could even win the presidential elections in France, uh, are um, gaining the most from the credit crunch, from the subsequent crisis, from austerity, from the crisis of the political and representative system. And I think that we have to be very careful about how we respond to this. There's a very traditional notion on the left, a good old Marxist notion of false consciousness. You know, the idea that these people, they're voting against their own interests. And we have to be very careful about this. Because the interests are actually much more interesting than we think. Interests are not given, you know, just because you happen to be working class. Um, there are lots of ways in which an interest can be construed relative to a given situation, relative to a conjuncture. There is no such thing as an interest that is independent of representation, of how it's represented, how it's symbolized. So when we talk about the representation of interests, the um, far right are very good at appealing to working people on the basis of some supposed national interest. And if you adopt a methodological nationalism in discussions of, say, migration, labor rights, and so on, it makes perfect sense. You would think that you had an interest in, in um, immigration controls and all the rest of it on that basis. So there's no way to talk about these interests unless you talk about the, the mode of articulation, how working class and popular interests are linked to a particular theoretical and intellectual horizon, and a moral horizon as well. There's something else um, which is linked to this, which is um, that in recent years, one of the um, major um, ways in which social movements have expressed themselves, their major form of militancy, has been to occupy a public space. We've seen this from Tahrir Square to the Occupy movement, to the Indignados, okay? And this gave us a huge jolt of energy at the time when it began because 
what we were seeing here was uh, a revival of the spirit of the anti-capitalist movement, but we were also seeing something that was, in each of these instances, simultaneously a protest, a prefigurative moment where you actually try to have some form of direct democracy among ordinary people. Anybody could join in, anybody could be part of the discussion, anybody could help make a decision. And also a platform for further action, for further protest. So there was something quite unique about these spaces. But there was a weakness. And this is a weakness that we're going to have to confront in future um, struggles. Because the most fundamental weakness was that the spaces that they occupied were strategically negligible. They didn't matter to anybody, but really, okay, they were public spaces, so they mattered to the extent that they were symbolic. But they didn't disrupt anything in the system. They didn't stop anybody from making a profit. They didn't stop any arms sales. They didn't stop any government from passing a law. Things just went ahead more or less as they had been intending to go ahead. And at the end of the day, when the state uh, and the organization or organizations of the police and the legal networks associated with them found the initiative, found a way to take the initiative, they shut these spaces down really quickly, really brutally, really effectively, and they never, in most cases, came back. And the illusion here was that you could somehow live outside the state. And this is the classically autonomous idea that we can separate ourselves from the state and we can develop our own forms of democracy and we can choose to uh, live autonomously uh, from the state. And this comes out of real experiences, real struggles like the Zapatistas, but I think that we are not in a position to opt out of the state. Um, and that in most cases, um, whatever you think about the Zapatistas, we will not be, be able to reproduce that kind of situation. And this is because the traditional way in which uh, autonomous view the state is as and the traditional way in which the left has viewed the state, frankly, is indiscriminately as a machinery of repression. Now, there's no question that the state is repressive. This is one of its primary things. This is what it does. It's not just repressive. If it was just repressive, then it would have no foundation in society. If it was just repressive, it would have very little support. It is also productive. It is involved not just in um, suppressing things that the system doesn't want or doesn't need, but in producing the things that it does need, producing certain subjectivities. You think about it, from the day you were born, you're given a name, you're given a nationality, you're given a gender, you're given an identity, and all of this is through and in the state. You are part of the state from the second you're born. From before you're born, actually, these things are assigned to you. And gradually, as you go through family life, you go through the education system, you're exposed to, exposed to the media, you acquire more and more of your identity, more and more of who you are, uh, as you uh, uh, rely to some extent on maybe child benefits, uh, as you rely on the, any public health care that's going, as you um, uh, require state assistance to um, uh, manage periods of unemployment, or anything like that. The state is there very much involved in the reproduction of social relations and in the maintenance of uh, an unstable system of compromises through which we are integrated into the system. So, the expanded state of the 20th century is not just a machinery of repression, and the neoliberal state of the 21st century hasn't stopped being an expanded state. Its own myth-making says that it's constantly trying to downsize, you know, it's all about cuts, we're trying to uh, streamline our, product, uh, our production and so on and so on. But actually the neoliberal state is a big state and it's very much involved in the expansion of state capacities. What's changing under neoliberalism, and this is neoliberals were very aware of this in their own writings, regardless of what they told the public, in their own writings, when they were talking to fellow intellectuals, to one another, they said what matters about the state is not the quantity of its action, 
but the kind of its action, what it is intended to do. And the whole point about the neoliberal period has been the restructuring of the state to make it into what you might call a competition state. A competition state for three reasons. One, because it is involved in uh, extending the competition ethic within the economy, getting rid of the traditional corporatist intervention measure, uh, interventionist measures, getting rid of traditional Keynesian support for demand and so on, using the market as a disciplinary mechanism to drive up productivity, to force uh, failing businesses to go under and so on. Two, to remake the structure of the state internally in the model of markets, in the model of businesses. And increasingly what you see is state apparatuses which uh, are either run by businessmen or re refashioned and remodeled and retooled to look like businesses. You know, you've got internal markets. But this isn't necessarily more efficient at all. In, for example, in the in National Health Service in England, when they brought in internal markets, one result was to drive up overhead costs from 3% of the total to 15% of the total. It really uh, was a massively inefficient move, but it was part of the neoliberal practice because once you introduce internal markets, once you introduce competition, well, that's a great way to battle workers. It's a great way to uh, extract uh, more work from them for less. If you know that you've got to compete with another part of the National Health Service, um, you have this incentive Apparently, this is their model, to um, uh, be more efficient. That's the idea. And thirdly, the third way in which the neoliberal state is a competition state is in its intention to produce neoliberal subjects. Subjects who welcome the cut and thrust of competition. Subjects who basically see themselves as chunks of capital, cognitive capital, physical capital, erotic capital, bits of capital that you can invest and return uh, and get a, a return of an income stream. Okay, they want you to see yourself as mini enterprises, and this is what the whole restructuring of welfare is about. It used to be welfare was something you were entitled to as a matter of citizenship. You were born as a citizen. You had entitlement to welfare under X number of conditions. Increasingly, it's a form of moral regulation. I mean, it always had this element, but this is more and more to the fore. In effect, you can get welfare if you prove that you're a good subject, that you have internalized the work ethic, the neoliberal work ethic. Because the whole point about neoliberal uh, ideology is that the classic subject of economic theory, homo economicus, you know, who by nature trucks, barters, and trades, doesn't exist. They know that person doesn't exist, but they assume that person can be made. And if you uh, restructure the incentives and the punishments that they are faced with in their day-to-day -day life, the balance of risks and rewards that they're faced with, you can make people choose to be competitive entrepreneurial creatures. So that is the way in which the state has been reformed. It has got nothing to do with downsizing the state. And therefore, we shouldn't assume that we are somehow capable of being outside the state. We are all inside the state, whether we like it or not. And the question is, to what extent is the state a terrain of struggle? When public sector workers want to strike, it is a terrain of struggle. When you have a parliamentary contest and there's a serious left challenge, there's a terrain of struggle. When you've got, uh, you know, government media apparatuses and there's some sort of uh, argument going on within them, there's a struggle going on. When you've got uh, higher education and students are struggling over their rights within the higher education system, that is a, a terrain of struggle. So I think we should see the state not as something that is uh, simply open-endedly uh, available for us to, as popular masses, working class people, to capture for our own ends. It's, it's not like that. It's monopolized in uh, the uh, dominance of it by the ruling class and its allies. But we can work within it. We can work and build resistances within it and maximize the antagonisms and contradictions that exist within state apparatuses to advance our own agenda. Okay, And that's what I think the imperative is if you've got a, a decent left parliamentary group. 
And ultimately, the goal here should be, uh, when you're working within the state apparatuses, uh, not just to um, you know, formulate a decent, nice leftist policy to redistribute a bit of wealth or to, uh, you know, in ensure that we can have rights for uh, LGBT people and so on. These are all good things, but actually, really, the ultimate goal, if you're on the left and if you're working in the state, is to disrupt it. It's to have a rupture. And what that means is you want to disrupt the power networks that are traditionally dominating it. And the only way that you can disrupt it, since you don't control the state apparatuses, is to be, is to be integrally linked to a militant movement, a working class based social movement beyond the terrain of the state. So there needs to be a link between popular mass movements and activities within the state in order to create that kind of rupture. Final uh, hypothesis I'll advance on this uh, uh, question is on how we create lasting successes. Um, there's a kind of short-termism on much of the left, certainly on the left that I come from, um, and maybe you'll have had some similar experience of it, which is that there's always this feeling that the next big protest is going to be the one that rescues us. You know, the next big protest, the next big strike, and the balance of forces will tilt in our favour. We're just waiting for that to happen. It doesn't work that way. And if you look at how the ruling class has won its battles, if you look at how the political right has won their battles, you will see that they have been won through decades of careful, patient groundwork. They started work on the ideological terrain. You want to look at the counter-revolution of the 1980s, so-called counter-revolution, Reagan and uh, Thatcher and all the rest of it. They started their work in the 1960s in response to the new left. They started with propaganda. They started with think tanks. They started with media initiatives. And they started with the written word. And they carefully began to fight and win a series of arguments within civil society on their own side, of course, to mobilize their own constituencies and to develop a series of organic links between their institutions and their base. And it took them, you know, uh, essentially, I mean, where, where, where we're at today, 2015, it took, I mean, th they dominated from about uh, 19, uh, say the mid 1970s uh, until um, essentially uh, today um, on, on a neoliberal basis. But to get where they're at today, to have these kinds of victories, to lay in, uh, to lay the terrain, the uh, legislation that they've implemented, the uh, various uh, industrial and political battles that they've won, it took a long, long time, and it had to start with slow, patient groundwork and it had to start with ideological, cultural, and political work. And the left finds itself in a situation, to return to where I started, it finds itself in a situation where it was unable to respond productively and effectively to the worst capitalist crisis in generations, and that is precisely because that groundwork had not been done. Far worse than that, we had lived, for most of us, in the illusion that we were actually doing okay and that really all that was required was for some big crisis to give us an opportunity. What the crisis exposed was that our institutions, our uh, infrastructure, our material basis was totally emaciated, and so we have a generation's work to do. It doesn't mean to say that we can't look forward to successes in the short term, but lasting successes, successes which fundamentally tilt the balance of, fo of power and the balance of forces in favour of you, and your friends and your family, uh, in favour of your allies. These aren't won immediately. So, we need in the short term to continue to experiment in various forms of creating a habitable, uh, comradely culture on the left and various ways of working together which aren't auto-marginalizing, which aren't subcultural, which aren't self-ostracizing, and which enable us to work together democratically and effectively. 
But in the long term, we need to be thinking about what kind of organization we need to have in 10, 15, 20 years. What kind of organization do you think you're going to need? I would say that you're going to need an organization of tens of thousands. And you're going to need an organization that is that popularly rooted and which has its base in trade unions, uh, a revived trade union movement, uh, as well as in popular social movements. And you're going to want to have a foothold in parliament and you're going to want to have uh, your own popular media and your own cultural uh, venues as well. So these are the these, I mean, we should have our eyes on that kind of prize, and we should begin the work of doing that now. And that's the kind of, that's the strategic perspective that I think that would be most useful to, to us, rather than waiting for the next big thing to turn things around. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard, for your lecture. And, I, uh, and now I open the floor for discussion. Are there, are there any questions? Yeah. Anyone? Um, if not, I would uh, have a question for you, uh, uh, even two. One would be on the issue of the state. You mentioned uh, these neoliberal transformations of the state, and you also, on the other side, you mentioned this uh, interventionist state, you know, the social democratic state as we knew it uh, in the first post-war decades. But my question would be, you know, I mean, you provided some kind of an answer, you know, that um, the goal of the left when, you know, it has some semi-decent leftist party in the parliament should be to disrupt the state. But, I mean, I think the historical situation is even, you know, um, a little bit uh, more forward than that. For instance, in the case of uh, Syriza, I mean, what if, you know, left takes power? I mean, what to do with the state? I mean, what are the socialist transformations of the state that the socialist party and the movement should, you know, uh, try to achieve? This would be one, uh, the first of my questions. The second would be, um, I think it was Leo Panich um, uh, that we hosted uh, um, where you were sitting uh, uh, last year um, and he uh, proposed a strategy, I mean not only him, I mean I think this is a very um, common view, the strategy of let's say it, um, revolutionary reformism, you know, where the leftist parties should uh, struggle for some reformist um, policies and this will some, in some way uh, radicalize uh, uh, the uh, masses, the, uh, the working class, into the socialist direction. But I think, once again, you know, we have this, this example of Syriza, where their in incapability, let's say, say let's uh, call it like that, you know, to, uh, to formulate this plan B, you know, even as a possibility, a plan B as uh, exiting the Eurozone, you know, prevents them from having any kind of manure space um, uh, right now when they are facing with the structural, um, structural limits of the European Union. So basically, I mean, in, um, when we are talking about, you know, uh, socialist strategy and when we are talking about, you know, this dominant view of uh, um, revolutionary uh, reformism, my, my question would be, you know, how to connect point A with point B, you know, how to can connect reformist policies with the uh, general socialist goals of this strategy. Does this work? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, well, to answer that, um, I think the uh, problem with Syriza and the problem that they're facing is that they did not prepare people for the scale of the struggle that would be necessary in order to win the fight against austerity. They told uh, their voters that they could have the Euro, they could stay in the Eurozone, and they could have uh, an end to austerity. Everybody wins, everybody's happy. They told their voters that essentially you uh, go to the European Union you form some alliances with uh, what's called the good euro, um, you know, some allies, hopefully the French government, hopefully the Italian government, uh, maybe some other parties like Der Linke in Germany and what have you, and that they would back Syriza up and that would tilt the balance in the negotiations. 
No such thing happened. It was totally unrealistic. They were never going to have these allies. They should have been prepared to at least threaten a Brexit and a, a very rapid and expeditious one, uh, if only uh, to show that they uh, meant business. Unfortunately, by telling their opponents in the negotiations that they would do anything but leave the euro, uh, they weakened their position. And so they ended up cutting a deal um, where essentially they gave up on a large part of their program um, and still didn't get any money. They were told they were going to get this money, they still haven't seen a bloody penny of it. Even the money they own, that the Greek government is legally owed, they haven't seen a penny of it. They're going bankrupt. They don't even know whether they'll be able to pay their own workers at the end of the month. It's hit or miss. They have no idea. And they're being starved uh, out by the European Union establishment. So they needed to have a, a, a precisely a strategy of ruptures. They needed to come in and use the momentum and use the initiative and say, in order to win this fight, we're going to need you, our base, to support us. We cannot rely on you being passive. You know? And this is the problem with parliamentary democracy in general. It relies on popular passivity. You, know, you vote for some people and they'll go do it for you. And that's what Greek voters, frankly, you know, when you saw the interviews with them on the streets, uh, the Vox Populi, the journalistic accounts, many, many Greek voters thought, well, you know, we'll get Syriza elected and that's the end of the story. It never is. They should have told people, we're going to have to fight like hell for this. We may have to have an exit. We may have to have a plan B, and we need you to support us. Now they're in a situation where, if they do have to have a Brexit, uh, they're talking about having a referendum, losing yet more initiative. Um, you know, they're, they're, there's a large mass of the population that probably won't understand. You know. So uh, I, I, I agree with you. I think um, that. Um, when you can take state power, well, not state power, let's not confuse that with governmental power, but when you can take office, um, you have to essentially use every bit of initiative you have and keep the momentum and dynamism on your side, because there's a limited period of time before uh, a number of things happen. One, that the ruling classes that are against you uh, mobilize their forces to encircle you and to isolate you and to divide your own cabinet. I mean, this is what happened with Syriza. There's been a careful planned strategy of separating off the, the so-called hard left, the hardliners like uh, you know, Kouvlakis and Apodisas from the, the, the sort of good Syriza, the mainstream Syriza, it's a classic pact of dividing the rule. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, there, there, there was only a limited amount of time before that would start to work. Uh, there's also only a limited amount of time before, in, you know, Palancian terms, they managed to shift the locus of dominance within the state apparatuses from, say, an elected executive to an upper chamber or to the judiciary or something else in order to uh, wage an effective counter uh, battle. And I fear that what could happen here if Syriza continues to lose momentum uh, is that forces within the state, the deep state, you know, the intelligence services, the security forces that are linked to uh, the boss of uh, this uh, independent Greek party, and uh, forces within the police that have links to the Golden Dawn could orchestrate uh, something uh, pretty ugly, um, and essentially the uh, Syriza experiment would be dead. And uh, those who say there is no alternative, you know, the, the, man the mantra of capitalist realism will be redoubled in their convictions, and we will have a lot harder fight um, over the next few years. Thank you, uh, thank you Richard. Uh, are there any questions? Yeah. Uh, is it uh, I have more of a comment. Uh, when we are talking about strategy, we are mostly thinking about two things. First thing is how to attack something, how to destroy something. And second thing, we are thinking how to achieve something. So how to build or how to pass a certain law or something like that. But I think that the third point that we are always missing, and uh, it is, I think, one of the most important, is how to reproduce uh, the question of reproduction of the movement. Uh, because we know that the, the lives that we are living are mostly relied on the uh, circulation of capital, of the state power, how the state is functioning, for example, and we are mostly tied to it, and we don't have 
autonomous, independent sources of reproduction. For example, if you have a strike, you have to survive, you have to organize food chains, you have to organize how to, uh, I don't know, don't be kicked out, kicked out of the flats when you don't have the money to pay rent and things like that. So when we're thinking about a strategy, we also need to think more and I think really more built on the uh, forces of the reproduction of the forces that we're building uh, and the reproduction of the autonomous ways of living. Uh, and I think that this, I don't know why this question is always forgotten, why we are not thinking about it, but I think this is an important thing when you're thinking about a strategy to have in mind. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with all of that. <laughs> Any more questions, comments? Yeah, what you pro proposed seemed the extremely um, easy. You know, I said, well, let's look at what Thatcher did and uh, try to accomplish that. Uh, <coughs> But I think um, that's far too optimistic because they haven't been laying the groundwork, you know, from the 60s and then stopped when they got to power or stopped when they got out, kicked out of power. They've been laying the groundwork up to this day, you know, taking, uh, you know, exposing states to discipline of international financial markets, transforming the IMF, the World Bank, uh, strengthening the, you know, the, the global mobility of. Uh, of capital, the capacity you know, to, to capital to move uh, out of a country and punish it for you know, deviating from um, the correct uh, path. Um, so I think you know, even if you take government, you know, you, you can have you know, every, every office in, in in a nation state. You still haven't really taken power. So how how do we? Operating in those conditions, as, as we can see it, you know, on the level of European Union, capital has uh, very well adapted, you know, to this not only European context but global context. While workers' movements, uh, unions um, remain, you know, largely or almost ex exclusively nationally based. I, I I see the strength of this uh, point, but um, I would um, qualify it a bit. Um, yes. Capitalism has internationalized. Um, that is uh, an inherent tendency in capitalist development. And it is a problem that the working class movement is not sufficiently internationalized. There's very little international solidarity. I mean, we can sit here and criticize Syriza, for example, but they've been, they've been left totally, almost totally isolated by the European left. Barely anybody, any labor movement, any left has lifted a finger. Um, so um, th this uh, is, is something, uh, definitely a problem that we have to confront. I agree with you if the point is that we need to have an internationalist strategy rather than one that's nationally based. However, um, in answer to your point about what you can do at a national level, in a national government, I think still the nation state is the strategically privileged terrain of national, of, sorry, of capital accumulation. I think that uh, companies need a national basis. Uh, by and large, their international operations aren't very good unless they have state support, and they generally do. Uh, just to take some examples of uh, capital success, like Apple, you know, um, if you think about uh, this uh, device here, I mean, most of the technology in it was made by the Department of Defense or by various uh, science and technical bureaucracies associated with the American Department of Defense. Most of the labor that made the uh, device was uh, uh, made accessible through US imperialism, not just uh, war, but financial imperialism, opening up markets through diplomatic pressure and so on. Um, many, many of the consumers of the product uh, now in China, again, opened up through um, US political power. This is state power that works here. So um, it's still very important uh, whether, whether you can cont, uh, get some sort of leverage within uh, national states. What can you do? Uh, I mean, uh, if I was uh, Alexis Tsipras <laughs> um, or something like that, I would nationalize the banks. That would be a starting point. You know why? Because 
First of all, uh, you're taking away the central institutional basis of ruling class power. It's a huge attack on the, the, uh, the institutional basis on which they get their leverage. I mean, you think about the banks, it's not just that they, can, they have so much control over the money supply and so on. They're also a factory for producing organic intellectuals of capitalism. Most of the intellectuals and uh, experts who go out and organize capitalism and spread neoliberal doctrines to uh, other parts of the world and so on are based in banks. I'm sure that you guys uh, have had experience of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development because it's a transitional society. Uh, there and uh, essentially, you know what, uh, you know, you, you could see very, very, very well what was going on. I mean, basically, people from the European banking system and European business were being uh, farmed out as. Uh, uh, intellectual experts in restructuring your business, restructuring your uh, enterprise. And what, generally speaking, they did was they came to your countries and they told you how many people to fire um, and how, how you could restructure your business and, uh, with uh, much less labor costs. Um, so these are the, uh, the banks are really the center of a lot of the expertise in the spread and preservation and, uh, and consolidation of capitalism. So if you take out that pillar of ruling class power, you have really reduced uh, their, their strength relative to the working class very quickly, but you've also given any elected government a huge lever uh, in which to intervene in the economy, to direct funding towards green investment, to direct funding towards job creation, to direct funding towards loans for, you know, zero interest loans for working class families and what have you. Um, I think that that would be, and given that the banks are the, the center of ruling class power at the moment, I think that would be the logical thing for any radical government to do. And the, thankfully, the banks are all political creations. Okay, they, they, None of them exist without the state telling them exactly how much they can do, what they can do, what uh, kind of lending they can engage in, what kind of borrowing they can engage in, what the uh, legal um, and political basis is. So. The national state is still very important, is my point. More questions? Um, if I may be a bit cheeky, uh, I, think, I think here in Slovenia we uh, already managed to check out most of the uh, pointers that you uh, brought out in your lecture in terms of strategy. Um, we, we uh, uh, took out our infatuation as with the Zapatistas long ago. We decided that uh, forming a party and uh, participating in, parliamentarian, uh, in the parliamentarian arena is a, a, a legitimate course of action. I think this is something that most of the people in this uh, uh, hall agree on. There may be varying accounts as to how successful the United Left is at the moment, but I, I, I think there is a consensus that this is the appropriate strategy. And also, um, I mean, it, it's a, this society here is a good starting point. Uh, it's small, it's manageable, it's young. Uh, um, so, and, and also, uh, uh, the discontinuity of political traditions and organizations is also, in a way, a good thing. There, there's not much residual autonomism or Trotsky, or these bad, bad kind of... Uh, leftist political ideologies that are really hardcore in terms of uh, identity. Um, we do not have factions in terms of what is the appropriate, appropriate uh, uh, account of Cliffite's uh, uh, definition of state capitalism and so on. Um, so, so in all of these things, I, I think this is a very good society to start to implement a socialist strategy. But then we come to this point where I think we uh, are experiencing a bit of a problem. Uh, you, you said that uh, a parliamentarian group needs to have a link uh, uh, with a radical movement. Radical in a sense of uh, it gets ideas which are um, above and beyond uh, what is manageable to passing legislation, um, right? And um, the problem here is, I think, uh, to, to, to just caricaturize a bit, a, a tire has not been burned here since perhaps, I don't know, 1989 or something like that. And then we had a, a, a decade of trying to catch up with the civilized West as a transitional society. Then we had 10 years of uh, having this idea of being the Swiss of the Balkans and life was good. Um, 
and well, lately it has been the crisis, right? Um, I, well, um, and th th this notion of like workers being radical, for instance, there's no need to romanticize this. I think you will agree with me. Um, radicalness is not a, a essential human personal trait of some social grouping. It comes through organization. Now, here, here's, the, here's where discontinuity becomes a problem. And what I would like to ask you um, is to step a bit from the area of strategy and double into the area of tactics as to uh, how to begin establishing this uh, 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 more organizing of a radical movement which is going to uh, uh, push the parliamentary uh, uh, grouping further and keep it on track. Okay. Um, a few things. I mean, just to say, first of all, I'm extremely glad if there's a consensus uh, in the room on the key strategic questions. Um, I would, although I would hope that there is a, there's going to be some contestation at least. Um, but on the um, question of how to um, build a radical working class movement which would be capable of sustaining a leftist challenge within the parliamentary system, um, it seems to me that there are a few observations that uh, are not necessarily connected up, uh, but which are worth making and which can come at this from various directions. One of them is that we cannot look to the traditional labor bureaucracies to do this. Um, they are too much too invested uh, in the present framework. Um, and therefore, we need to start looking at the disorganized working class. Uh, they are not necessarily, as you say, radical. I mean, they're not going to be spontaneously radical. Um, but uh, class struggle is uh, uh, not simply uh, a political process. It is a structural feature. It's uh, how the system is reproduced through struggle. And uh, there are possibilities and opportunities for organizing presently disorganized groups of workers on the basis that they have fundamental dissimilarity of interest with their bosses. So it seems to me that finding new ways to organize those workers, um, in the UK uh, we have uh, some limited experience of what are called pop-up unions. These are unions which emerge uh, independently of the existing trade union bureaucracy um, and which uh, you know, essentially uh, are set up purely for the purpose of waging some fight or other that needs to be had. And this has typically happened among groups of workers like cleaners in universities and so on, mainly migrant workers actually. Um, and if we can think about um, ways of innovating along those lines and connecting uh, those and articulating those groups, then we would have the beginnings of a militant working class movement. Uh, another um, approach to this is the Bolivian approach. Uh, the Bil Bolivians um, uh, had uh, a pretty advanced experience of neoliberalism in their workplaces in as much as one of the things that neoliberal restructuring does is to break up the big Fordist production lines and break up workplaces into small and often highly dispersed workplaces um, and often uh, very casualized workforces increasingly so. Um, you know, the zero hours contracts for example, uh, precarious work and all the rest of it. So you get these places which are extremely hard to unionize on the job because uh, like the place that I used to work at in the call center, um, you essentially would find that once you tried to ballot people to join a union or to have a strike, there were many, many more people on the workforce, nominally on the workforce, than you could ever hope to get in touch with to even ballot. Um, and they were still nominally on the workforce even though they hadn't worked in the company for ages. Um, because it was casual and uh, freelance and all the rest of it. So um, there are a lot of workplaces that are extremely difficult to organize at the point of production. But that doesn't mean to say that working class people don't have an interest in organizing as a class. So they started to organize in Bolivia, they started to organize in their communities. They started to build community unions. And that's how they rebuilt a labor movement. In Britain, there is a pale shadow of this, in the Unite uh, Union, which uh, hopes to build some kind of uh, trade union um, community structure, but 
they're not really putting enough effort into it, it's very top down, it's very bureaucratic. Um, and this is one of the problems that we face with the trade union movement. Uh, I think it's, it's uh, these are tendencies across the uh, industrialized world where trade unions are becoming increasingly tertiarized based in the public sector, increasingly bureaucratized, very top down, and increasingly strike action only takes place for uh, one or two days uh, on the, uh, having been given a considerable delay before taking place and are mainly done to demonstrate potential political, political clout of those involved, rather than to disrupt anything. So we need to rebuild a labour movement that is about disruption, that is about withdrawing uh, from the process of production and costing the bosses in terms of their profitability um, and uh, making the system not work for a period of time. Uh, we need to rebuild a, a, a labour movement uh, from the, from, at the molecular level in that way. The final thing I would say on this, which is, uh, again, is disconnected from that, but uh, we can fit them together somehow, um, is uh, there can be no voluntarism about this. We can't make it happen. We can't force it to happen. We can look to where the tendencies are and intervene constructively where things happen. But uh, alas, uh, I mean, if it so happens that in Slovenia or wherever there hasn't been a tire burn for more than for a couple of decades, um, and if it, it so happens that uh, uh, the major form of left advance is parliamentary, then um, you basically are going to have to find a way to consolidate and hold on to that ground until such a time as something opens up uh, on another terrain. Um, can I just say, we have three, four men, I think. Is there, are there any women who want to speak? Please. Uh, can I just... Okay, can I just upgrade on this, uh, what uh, the other person said? How can you, um, you said there can be a change without the uh, uh, violence struggle. How do you justify the militant action in the so-called democracy? So that it takes an effect in seizing means of production. How do I justify militant struggle in the context of a democracy? Uh, I would say the primary justification, uh, I mean, if you think about how it works and why it works, yes, it works, yes. it works because we make a contribution to the system. We make it work. Our cooperation is necessary to make it work. And therefore, if we are not being uh, recompensed, if we're not being accorded the rights and uh, the wealth and whatever else that we, it is we're entitled to, um, uh, that is commensurate with that. If, in other words, we are dissatisfied, we have a right to withdraw cooperation in that system. We have a right to disrupt it. We are not compelled uh, to uh, participate in something that is unjust. So if it's unjust, we can, uh, well, perfectly by right, um, uh, disrupt it. Um, and I would say that, um, if anything, um, you know, the the argument from democracy is, a re is really a, a reduction of democracy. It's a reduction of democracy to the spectacle. What they want you to do is go down to a public square, hold up a banner for about two hours, go home, and be happy with that, and nobody will pay any attention to you. How do you convince a common person that takes up part? How do you convince a common person to take part? It lives in the illusion of democracy. It lives in the illusion of democracy. Well, you know, it's not. It's not totally an illusion, is it? Because you can't go and vote, and you can't vote out the present government. I mean, you just have. To, I mean, the thing about it is, is that people change their ideas when their material circumstances cause them, give them reason to change their ideas, and when people like you, uh, you, you know, young radicals get involved in arguing with them and trying to explain to them, um, you know, patiently and without condescension, um, how they might see things in a different way. Are there any more questions? Preferably from a female person. <laughs> Why? Uh, no, I mean... Do you want to have a quota, you know? Like... I think Richard just wants to, you know, break a sausage fest. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I wanted to ask something before you mentioned that, but no, okay. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm going to come back, go back shortly to uh, the Syriza problem. 
Uh, you argued that uh, Syriza should have prepared its rulers or its base, whatever, uh, for, the, for the Brexit, right? So they should have told them before that, uh, okay, guys, uh, we have to get ready. The, 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 the thing the is going to get serious. Um, we need your support. But don't you think that in that case, people uh, in the context of major depoliticization, uh, in, in the context of lack of institutions, uh, organization, uh, or any terrain uh, where people or the masses were able to build their consciousness, this good consciousness, this consciousness to fight, uh, to go to the struggle. Don't you think that in that case, uh, had Syriza uh, um, implemented this, this uh, position, then people would just not kind of would have opted for somebody else, maybe uh, because they would want to give a, a, a chance to somebody who is kind of less radical. Because uh, if this this other person was giving them hope, for example. Okay, we can try this this softer approach. We can try to negotiate and then maybe uh, uh, be successful. And if that fails, then maybe we can go to some more radical um, actions. But uh, so that's why I think that had Teresa started uh, on this uh, uh, on this. Uh, no, um, uh, they probably wouldn't have got that many votes as they did. Um, well, this is my this is my speculation. So I'm, I'm just wondering, what's your position on that? Uh, I would say that there. I mean, that to uh, adopt that position, and I'm not even sure that was the service's position. This is my point. I don't think they even recognised that they would have to have a fight. I think they really did delude themselves. Um, and this is the impression I get from talking to people in Syria that the leadership really did believe what they were saying, that there would be a good Europe. Um, but if that was their position, it would be self-defeating, in my opinion, because it would be uh, making, uh, looking for a short-term advantage by sort of uh, downplaying a certain difficult fact, which would have the effect of producing a long-term disadvantage. I mean, it would be the definition of opportunism in that sense. Um, so I, I think, I can understand uh, that there would be all sorts of different ways of um, uh, conveying this point uh, diplomatically or uh, communicating it to uh, uh, masses of people without panicking them. Uh, and I understand it's difficult because, I mean, I, when I talk to friends in Greece, they always tell me, look, uh, if Greece withdraws from the Eurozone, it becomes a third world country. We've become isolated, we've become a Cuba on the Mediterranean, uh, we get embargoed, we're blockaded, who knows what. Uh, you know, and people, people want to go and shop at Zara, and they want to have uh, relatively cheap consumer goods. Even if you've got a certain, you know, there's something you can live um, uh, if, you, if you've got a job. So, um, and there's some idea of a sort of, uh, uh, some sort of future under neoliberal capitalism which isn't uh, being uh, isolated in the third world. So the, the problem here comes back to being a political one of what is the alternative. Uh, this is why I'm very glad that Costas Lapavis has outlined uh, a possible alternative. I'm not, I mean, I'm not saying that uh, that answers all the questions, but this is what was necessary. What was necessary was to outline the uh, conditions under which um, an alternative could be um, articulated. I mean, one problem if you don't tell people that there may be some difficulty coming up and you may have to have an alternative, even if you code it in the language of saying, let's say, not one sacrifice for the euro, you know, even if you, but just maintaining a sense that you, what you're doing is um, you, that you're not going to do anything for the euro, you know, that you, uh, there are limits, there are red lines. If you uh, make that case, at least that gives you a chance to um, uh, go back to the public and say, look, you know, we did, we did our best, we gave them everything we possibly could, they still don't want to negotiate, but we told you that there were certain red lines we wouldn't cross, we told you that we wouldn't make a sacrifice for the Euro, and now we're telling you that we think we need to fight. At least then they would have laid some of the ground for what they're doing. Instead, what they did was the exact opposite. They talked down the, the, the difficulties, they talked down the dilemmas, and they've left themselves in a situation now where if they do go for a referendum, uh, and they're subject to the usual <coughs> ideological blackmail campaigns, and, uh, the propaganda from the Greek media, uh, they won't have done anything to prepare the ground. And um, many people, the majority of Greek voters, still believe that the best future is in the Euro. Uh, so they haven't even you know, initiated that point back. Any more questions? Comments?
just this. Uh, why do you believe that most Greeks still believe that the best future is in the Europe? This comes back to the question of uh, interests. Your interest is never independent of representation, of your sense of the, of the horizon of possibilities, right? Now, if most Greeks really thought that there was a socialist uh, utopia possible tomorrow, uh, then, yeah, they would say, oh, I'd prefer that then, I think. I think most Greek workers would anyway. But most people don't think that, is, of that is a realistic possibility, and uh, the historical memory of Greek workers is of the period before um, the uh, entrance into Europe when Greece was a really um, uh, much more, pardon me, I, I don't like this language, but backward economically, backward country, um, much more impoverished, and, uh, and uh, lives were much more difficult, and nobody wants to go back to that. Uh, so, um, you know, there's a sense that, um, it, and that's why I say, if, if somebody could argue for an alternative, and, and it had some sort of, uh, dominant political expression, like Syriza has considerable clout now, if they were to argue for an alternative, it could start to get traction. Um, so, uh, you are talking about Greece and Syriza, but don't you think Syriza and Greece is under attack of neoliberalism, uh, this system? They want to destroy them, the fucking Cyprus. Uh, a lot of depend on, on success of Syriza. So, if they destroy Syriza, they destroy all movement in Europe. That's my opinion. Yeah. So, um, they have wars. Uh, I say, part of my language, fuck plan B. Let's fight. It's only way you will win. Only way. I mean, I, I obviously agree with you that uh, they're out to destroy Syriza. I mean, they've demonstrated this. The, the contempt displayed by Schoeffler, um has been nothing short of staggering. And uh, they have, I mean, even the pretense that the Troika wasn't, uh, been, hadn't been reimposed. Schoeffler broke through that very quickly. He said, yeah, the, the institutions are the Troika. This is the Troika. The Troika is once again in control of Greece. Um, sorry, but the next is Podemos in Spain. Sorry? The next is Podemos. The next what? They will have elections soon. Right. And the cancer of the uh, fight will move across to Europe. And uh, this system is afraid of this cancer. Yeah, I think they are afraid. Um, and I think that they're right to be afraid. Uh, I think, unfortunately, though, these challenges that you're talking about, I mean, the strongest ones are in Southern Europe. Um, the, in Northern Europe, you know who's uh, gaining? I mean, I mentioned this earlier. Um, it's the far right. In Britain, uh, UK just got 4 million votes. Uh, and had the system been proportionate, they would have 81 seats, and they would be doing a lot, of, having a lot of influ influence and impact on national policy. Uh, in uh, uh, France, um, they came first in the most recent polls, and there's every chance that they could come first in the next presidential poll, um, the Front National. So um, we have to have a complicated view of what's happening here. The left are not the only ones to be getting here, and it is uh, indicative of the imperialist structure of the European Union, its colonial and uh, semi-colonial sort of structure, that it is the creditor nations where the right is on the advance, and the debtor nations where the, the left is on the advance. So if serious are false, Gordon Don rises. If, if serious are false, I think Gordon Don, yes, absolutely. 